Hi, everybody. My name is Tony Gale. I am a Sony artist in imagery. And today we're here to go over social distancing portraiture outdoors. Um, it's a complicated world we're in, so hopefully it's a relevant topic for you all. I'm also a Manfrotto ambassador and ex right Colorado and the APA national president. All right, so I am a commercial photographer. I mostly shoot people and portraits for a living. I do some landscape stuff for fun, but it's mostly people and portraits. I bring around a bunch of gear. And uh, let's get started. So social distancing portraiture. We're in the world of COVID. Um, I'm going to cover some safety things, talk about portraiture, outdoors versus indoors, social distancing, self-portraits as an option, uh, compositing as an option for groups, uh, lighting a little bit, and where, how to find a place to shoot. I do want to say to start with, I am not a medical professional. I am telling you what I do and what I think is best. That said, I am not somebody, I'm just like that meme on Facebook that you should ignore. Pay attention to the professionals who know what they're doing. Listen to me, but don't take anything I say as 100% gospel because like I said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in government, I'm not a nurse or a doctor. I'm basing it on my best understanding of the situation but just please bear that in mind. I say the same thing when I copy, talk about copyright or taxes. So the first and perhaps most important thing with safety is to follow whatever local laws and guidelines there are where you are. We're a big country and it's a big world. People could be watching this from anywhere. Wherever you are, there's gonna be rules and criteria you need to be aware of and pay attention to. And that should be foremost. So in New York City, for example, in New York State, we've had different stages of opening with COVID. As a commercial photographer, I was not legally allowed to work until stage two. Uh, and then there's stage three and four. But even those stages, some places have three stages. And there's no consistency among states and regions as to what those stages mean. So just pay attention to what you're supposed to do where you are. And if it says you have to do this to be compliant with the law and safe, then you should do that, whatever that may be. I also follow the World Health Organization and CDC guidelines. Please wear a mask, maintain social distancing. If you really wanna get into the nitty gritty um, and see what it's like for a really big production, SAG-AFTRA has production guidelines. If you go to their website at sagaftra.org, it's called the Safe Way Forward. And those are production guidelines for like film and television, but it gives you a sense of how people are thinking about it and what is involved on a really big production. For most of us, most of the time, we're not on something at that level. They want a set medic and they want a COVID compliance officer and a lot of things that aren't necessarily relevant if it's you and one person or you and a family or five people. But it is a good idea to just see what people who are really digging in uh, have to say on the topic. And then a couple other things. There are things called COVID compliance officers. I'm actually gonna take a class tomorrow to become one. There's also COVID awareness certificates and certifications. Uh, I'm not putting up any particular companies for those because I don't, I'm not familiar enough with them to tell you that this company or that company is the right company or the wrong company. But if you are out there shooting professionally, I think it's worth looking into. If for no other reason than your awareness goes up and your clients and your subjects may feel more comfortable knowing that you've done these steps to just be aware and safe. The COVID compliance officer uh, thing I'm doing tomorrow is 50 bucks. So it costs money, but not that much. Uh, many of the COVID awareness certifications are free. All right, portraiture. Oh, actually, before I continue, if you have questions, uh, please speak up and ask those questions. I do have the question box open, so I will try and pay attention and answer questions as they come up. If you answer 
or if you ask questions on social media, hopefully those will be passed on to me at the end. Uh, but if you're in the Zoom and you want to ask a question, you put it in the box. I will try and get to it uh, as quickly as possible. So portraiture, photographs of people. I like photographing people. Hopefully, if you're watching, you do too. That's why you're here. I, it's great to meet new people. It's great to interact with people. To me, one of the most important things is making sure they're comfortable and relaxed. Part of the way I shoot is I tend to interact with people. Uh, I'll ask them questions and try and get those moments that are in between uh, the pose things. There are lots of people who will, po who will shoot by saying, you know, look to the left, chin down a little, eyes up here, put your left hand here, put your right hand there. And that is absolutely fine. And I know people who get great pictures that way. For me, the way I shoot is much more casual and relaxed. And then I just shoot a lot. One of the great things about shooting with Sony is because I'm using an A7R4 now and the R3 and before that the R2 with the eye autofocus, I don't have to worry about the focus because with eye autofocus on, it's always gonna find that eye or almost always. And so, and with the screen, I can have the camera up, looking at the corner of my eye, still maintain eye contact with my subject, still be looking at them and still interacting with them. Now, especially with masks on, which disrupts a little bit of that communication, being able to maintain eye contact so there isn't a camera in front of my face all the time, I find to be really, really helpful. Uh, so, Available Light, Outdoors in California. An actress is to Salman Rushdie, the writer. This is for a magazine called Poets and Writers for their cover. To start with, I'm just going over a handful of portraits and then we'll start getting into the details. This was also in California. I rented this camper, uh, shot with a little bit of flair just to make it interesting. Some fitness stuff, Central Park. Probably some of you recognize this. It's over by the fountain, the park on the Upper West Side. The mayor of uh, Fort Worth, Texas, very nice woman, threw a piece of sculpture in front of City Hall. So you can see with all of these, mostly people are interacting with me, but not always. And I'm using different lighting, I'm using different situations, indoors, outdoors. It's just a mix. There's no right answer or wrong answer. Las Vegas. So indoors versus outdoors. Right now, be, again, because of COVID, I think that for the most part, shooting outdoors, photographing people outdoors is going to make them the most comfortable and be the safest thing because of the air movement, because you have more space. If you're shooting indoors, unless it's a really big space, it's just trickier. You know, in the past, you could have a little studio set up somewhere small, you put a couple of people in there, and now to maintain that six feet or more and that distancing, especially because your subject is probably not gonna be wearing a mask, it can be really challenging. So if you can, I would suggest outdoors or making sure you have a nice big space. This is outdoors in Prospect Park, also in Prospect Park. But indoors, you do have a lot more control. You know, you can bring props, you can control the lighting more, you can control the background more. So lighting and backgrounds can make shooting indoors worth it or important. Just if you're gonna do that, be cautious. All right, so. We're gonna get into some of my ideas and suggestions for how you might consider social distancing and being creative. I do think limitations like this can be really helpful creatively because it can cause you to come up with new ideas instead of doing the same thing that you always do. I, I can't speak for any of you obviously, but I find that when I am photographing people I can sometimes get into a rut where I just do the same thing the same way, put the light on the same place, use the same modifiers, the same background. And so in a situation like this where 
there are limitations because of the situation we're in in the world, it can open up some creativity. There's a lot of people, for example, uh, two of my fellow artists, Paul Giro and uh, Jean Lower have done projects photographing people uh, outdoors. There's a lot of people doing the front porch pod project, but Paul Giro is the first person I saw do it. And Gene has been doing things where he's been photographing from the inside of his truck with an infrared camera and a strobe so that he can maintain that distancing. Those are both projects that probably never would have happened. And it's, you know, I don't want to be putting too much of a silver lining on everything, of course. But creativity comes from challenge. This is a photo I did several years ago for a magazine. Uh, this is a portrait of the woman who owns this company on the Upper West Side. And I am shooting through the front window. You can see a little bit of a reflection. I have a strobe on the right. So it's lighting her. Uh, it's a little bit later in the day. If you're trying to do this in the middle of the day, you have to put a lot of light on your subject. A lot of, you're gonna need a strobe because otherwise you're gonna get too much reflection from the street. You could try a polarizer, but I think even with that, it's gonna be a little limiting. But this, I mean, it's hard to get more safe and socially distanced than 10 feet away with a plate of glass and a door between you and your subject. So that's one thing to consider. And it was the best way to get this, to get the perspective I need. This shop is really quite small. And if I was inside, I wouldn't be able to uh, get the distance I needed to really get that expansive shot without some distortion from the wide angle. And if you look in the mirrors, you can see some of the street, you can see a parking sign on the left. You also have the option when you're shooting outside and socially distancing to use foreground elements. This is an actress I photographed in Prospect Park a few weeks ago. And to me, adding some elements can really make it interesting. So I have her here. Some of them were looking at camera, some looking off with that bright pop of orange from her scarf and framing it with the tree in the foreground so that it adds some visual interest. You know, the park is cool, but sometimes it can be busy. And so with everything out of focus, it softens that. It helps focus it while still keeping things interesting. And it allows me to, to frame it up in a way that if I needed negative space for copy or for a caption, it's there. Similar thing here. To me, that left side of the frame, I liked it, but you can see how it's a little bit brighter. You can see the street through the trees there. Without this leaf and branch in the foreground, that street was a little too bright. So by doing this, it feels a little bit like flair, but it, it adds some interest, it adds some element, and it helps focus the attention onto Christian here, an actor also photographed in Prospect Park. So it really helps make things a little bit more interesting. It helps keep it from just being, here's a picture of a person in front of a tree, which can be nice, but we've all seen that a million times and you don't want it to be too much like a senior portrait photo right now. Even though lots of senior portrait people need photos right now. There's also in New York City, a lot of really interesting places. Uh, and this, we'll get into a little bit of, of how to look for those places uh, towards the end. But it's an opportunity to try some of those outdoor spaces that you've always thought, oh, I'd like to photograph there. I have a whole list of them. There's this, uh, there's that little thing with columns on the Upper West Side, right by the West Side Highway that isn't really easy to get to, but someday I'm gonna go there and shoot. There's so many interesting places in New York and whatever city you're in, wherever you live, there's cool things that maybe you've been like, yeah, I should shoot there someday and you just haven't gotten around to it. Now's your chance. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the opportunity and go and take some cool pictures. But maintain your distance. So you can see I'm using the A7R4 
Again, the eye autofocus is amazing. This was with the 24105G. And you can see I'm probably 15, 20 feet from him. And I'm using the columns to hide things in the background. There were some people having lunch uh, back there. Uh, there was a little bit of some trash or garbage somebody had left. So I'm moving left and right and positioning him to hide the things that I don't want to see. I also have him off the sidewalk here so that if other people walk by, they're not uncomfortable and he's not uncomfortable by the fact that my subject isn't wearing a mask. Again, with the foreground elements, this is another view of the same spot. Uh, it was a little bit messy. There was some junk just below his feet on the, uh, on the inside of that fence. So I moved so that this wall sort of blocked him out and then it adds that interest with the out of focus line, with the diagonal line, it feels a little bit more active. It feels a little bit more energetic. You can see it here. So just by getting low, again, 24, 105, and you can see I'm quite far away. Again, maintaining that distancing. Even if you don't feel like that distance matters that much, your subject probably does. And if your subject is uncomfortable, that's gonna show in the pictures. It's really important to make sure that they are comfortable. Whether or not they're a client, whoever it is, that's quite important. You can see all my junk over there. But let's say you need to get closer. This is with the 90 macro. You wanna shoot a really tight portrait and you're in a situation where there isn't, to do that, to shoot with the 90 macro at this distance, it, I can't be more than six feet away, it's impossible. But another advantage of the Sony's is there is an app. Um, there's an app that will allow you to control the camera and your settings from your phone and see a live feed off of your phone, which will allow you to see exactly what the camera's doing, change your settings. You can't change the composition, obviously, because you can't move the camera, but you can have your subject move left or right and adjust with it that way. So for this portrait here, I had her move a little to the left, move a little to the right. I started out as horizontal, I didn't like it, so I had her step back, move the camera to vertical, did the same thing. You can see my mask reflected in the phone here. Because of that app, because of the play, uh, the Sony Imaging Edge mobile app, it used to be called Play Memories Mobile, and the settings on the camera, you can control that, which is a really useful thing if you need to get that closeness. Or if the, you know, maybe you're in a room, you need to photograph somebody in a room that's small, you can set everything up, have your subject go into the room and you can back out of the room. Uh, I talked to somebody the other day that did a whole series where he was physically in another room than his subject and just shot from that distance. But this is all other people. Maybe you don't want to photograph other people because you're uncomfortable or because it's hard to find them. Or like in New York City until uh, sometime in June, you can't really photograph other people. Consider self-portraits. So I did a self-portrait series for, I think it was 85 or 95 days on from sometime in March until phase two, when you could legally do commercial photography in New York. That is something that any of you can do. If you're sitting there, just, I wanna shoot, I'm reluctant to find people or I can't find people or I feel uncomfortable or unsafe finding people, consider self-portraits. If you're using a Sony, uh, you can use this Imaging Edge mobile app as I did. That's one easy way you can see the settings, you can see if you're in focus, you can adjust your head, you can make sure you're in the right spot or you can use the, uh, 
time lapse app, depending on the camera, if it has it, and just tell your camera to fire every five seconds or every 10 seconds. I've done both. It just depends on what you'd like to do. This picture was taken a few years ago when I was a little bit thinner uh, using an intervalometer. So it just took a picture every five seconds and I would change my head in between. I'm using a last of light background in a couple of strobes, but it just allows you to stay fresh. I started this self-portrait project because I wanted to make sure I was still taking pictures. It can be challenging to just sit there as a photographer for any of us, right? We're all photographers, whether or not you get paid to take pictures, if you take pictures at all, I think you're a photographer. You'll sometimes see on social media, people argue about who gets to call themselves a photographer. You're a photographer if you take pictures. You may not be a professional photographer, but that doesn't make you not a photographer. If you take pictures with your phone, you're a photographer. If you take pictures with a camera, you're a photographer. Amateur, professional, none of that matters. You're still a photographer. But you can get stale. If you don't take pictures a lot, uh, or at least regularly, you can get stale. You can get a little stiff. You can forget things. You can get awkward. So the self-portrait series was a way for me to make sure that I was still doing stuff, that I was still taking pictures. So that when people did call me, I wouldn't have to sort of relearn the beginnings of things with them. And I could just jump right in, especially if it's a paying client. It's not fair to them to not be ready. So these are some of the self-portraits because it was Instagram and I was doing them every day. I was trying to come up with different things to do every day. That was part of the challenge was how do I make a self-portrait that doesn't look the same as the self-portrait I did yesterday or a week ago. And I, to be honest, was quite relieved when phase two happened and I could stop because it was, it's really hard to come up with all those ideas. So this is just on our little terrace in Brooklyn little bit of a hot light, adding some light. This was using Imaging Edge Mobile, but with a five second timer so that I could start the camera and then hide the phone behind me before the camera fired, because otherwise you would see it in my hand. Same thing here. Uh, my girlfriend and I grilled for Memorial Day because Last year we had had people over and it just felt like the thing to do, even though this year it was just the two of us. So this is a Sony Speedlight to our right with an umbrella, with the last slide umbrella. And then the camera is fitting on that, sitting on that grill in the foreground with the Sony trigger. And it's a similar thing. I have it set, actually this one was set to be uh, going off every five seconds. So it would take a picture, I'd adjust, take a picture, I would adjust. And for some reason, this was one of the most popular of all the ones I did, even though it feels the most distracting to me. From the living room with the light outside, more of the foreground stuff that I like. I know because it's photography and it's subjective, there's things I'm gonna like that you're not, things you're gonna like that I'm not, totally fine. We don't all have to agree on what kinds of photos we like, and we shouldn't all agree on what kinds of photos we like or things would be boring. If we all like the same things, then things just get dull and nothing gets pushed and we don't learn about new things. This is when I really started trying to figure out things to do. So this was just in Photoshop. I had tried different ways to do this with an actual thing in the foreground and I couldn't come up with anything that I liked. So this is just putting a white layer over the image in Photoshop and just erasing down. And this was the last day. You can see the phone in my hand, uh, triggering the camera. My mask is around my neck. This was upstate. We'd just gone camping at some place that was an old zoo, um, which reminds you of how sad old zoos were. 
it's it really is uh, a shame and a challenge that animals used to have to be in such small cages. All right, but let's say that you don't want to do self-portraits and let's say you want to photograph a group. So you've got, this is obviously indoors, this was for a magazine and this is not the final version. You'll notice there's no shadows under anybody's feet. Um, so you've got a group, you want to photograph them, but you can't have everybody socially distance and this close. What this is, is four, five, eight or nine different pictures that are combined. So compositing is a way to solve that problem. This is obviously a composite because it's the same person five times. If you put your camera on a tripod, lock it down, it's very important that it not move, lock your focus, lock your exposure, have everything set. You can then have your subjects go in one at a time. So one person's on the left, and then the next person, then the next person, then the next person. And shoot each person individually, shoot five, 10, 15, 20, 50 frames of them, however many you need, until you're ready for the next person. It is important if the light is changing, uh, like if it's late day, you're going for that golden hour, so the light's changing quickly, you probably can't do 50 frames of everybody because the light will be too different between them. But you can do you know, five. And then in Photoshop, it's just as simple as picking your main image, doing the lasso around the images you want. You just click, hold down shift, drag it onto your main image, and it will put that picture from the other frame in exactly the right spot. You may have to do a little blending, use the eraser tool or something, but you'll notice that except for the one where he's sitting in the foreground, none of them overlap. That makes it really easy. If nobody overlaps, you can do it with very minimal Photoshop work. And maybe there's 10 friends that want to be in a picture together or five or your two best friends. It's an easy way to make it appear that everybody was there without making anybody feel uncomfortable, putting anybody in an unsafe situation. There's my camera locked down on my Gitzo. All right, we're gonna talk about some lighting. A couple things with interior lighting. Interior lighting is in some ways easier because you can control it. This particular picture was in Las Vegas. He's only lit by that fire on the left. It's a couple of strobes, a couple of Manfrotto one by one LEDs, window light. So interior light, you can control, you can turn out the overheads, you can make sure that the only light that's impacting anything is what you have. Once you're outside, you can build, and I have seen people do where they'll build essentially a tent. So black fabric on the left, black fabric on the right, black fabric over the top, and you can control it that way. But for most of us, that's not practical. So we have to think about lighting in a different way. You can do things like this, which I sometimes enjoy, where you use the flare, get the backlight, get that warm late day thing going on, get the weird uh, artifacting from the flare. That can be fun. It can also be challenging because it's difficult to control. It also can be challenging because most of the Sony lenses now, the coatings on them are so good that you don't get that much flare. So what I do is I add an uncoated glass filter only to get more flare. So the light reflects off the filter because the lens coatings are too good to get a lot of flare. You can use something like this where he's just inside there. This is at the old zoo in Los Angeles, another old zoo. Um, He's just inside, so there's no light coming from directly above him. So it doesn't get the raccoon eyes. It gets that nice flattering soft light from the front. Where we are is in the shade already, so it's already soft. And then with him being set back a little with that overhang, 
it causes the light to be a little bit more directional, so it can be quite soft. Then there's the classic just overcast day. This is a writer up in New Haven. Another overcast day. And then we have Venice, Italy. Venice, Italy is a little bit like New York City in that there's a lot of narrow places. And so if the sun is low, you can get really beautiful streaks of light coming in that you can put your subject in that light, but have shadow all around so that they really stand out. I've done that, especially in downtown Manhattan. And it feels a little bit like they're lit because you're controlling it with the placement but you're still using available light. If you're traveling to say Italy, maybe you can't fly with that many lights. I certainly didn't. So it allows you a little bit more flexibility if you just think about the direction of the light and pay attention to where it's coming from. And then of course there's artificial light, strobes, constant lights, speed lights. Strobes are what I use the most when I'm photographing outdoors with light because of the power. So I use a combination of Bowen strobes, brown color strobes, and Profoto strobes, just depending on what I'm doing. This is two lights. There's a backlight coming from the left. You can see the highlight on his jacket there on the vest. And then the main light coming from the right in a soft box. And those are both a little bit bright to help make the dark background go a little bit dark because there's a lot going on back there. It can be a little distracting. It is part of the environment that we were looking for. He's on this forklift. It's supposed to look construction -y and industrially, but there's a lot going on and you don't want to draw too much attention to it or I didn't. So this is a way that you can control that. If you add light to your subject and not to the background, obviously your subject gets brighter. There's more control. This was at Sony Condo. 2.0 in Monterey. This model's name is Jean. This is using a strobe with a softbox to just add a tiny bit of light. So you can see that there's some direction to the light. It's coming from the right. It was an overcast day, but it was the middle of the day. So there is light coming from the top, but by adding just that little bit of softbox to the right, it helps direct it and give it direction and make it look a little bit more flattering. So there's no raccoon eyes. He's turned towards the light, which I tend to like. And again, I like that foreground stuff, so I'm low. This is at Condo last year, Condo 3.0 in Oregon. Another soft box to the right. You can see it's a bright sunny day. So what I've done here is move the model into the shade so that when I add strobe, it's more dramatic. If you have somebody in direct sun, you need a lot more power, you need a lot more light to be able to actually control it. So I, by putting her in the shade, I made it a little bit darker, the background's brighter, and when I add light to it, I can control it better and I don't need as much. So it'll recycle faster. Depending on the strobe you're using, you may not even have enough power if you're in full sun. This was for a catalog the same as that construction guy. Um, this is actually three strobes outdoors, but this was about four o'clock in the afternoon on a cloudy day. It was still full daylight, just overcast. And I've used the strobes to bring everything down so it feels dark to really make him pop. None of us like the art director didn't like that background, none of us did. So I've just made it dark and a little bit moodier so that it becomes more interesting. There's a light again from the left, that rim light, softbox on the right. And then there's a light hitting the basketball hoop on the back just to help give it a sense of place with that basketball. Softbox in California again. Uh, this is, again, I like to talk to my subjects and interact with them. And sometimes I get things like this, which I love, where they're laughing or they're reacting. I have no idea what I'd said or what he'd said that made them laugh. But it makes it 
feel more authentic to me. It feels like more like a real moment, which is part of the goal I have when I'm photographing people. And then there are things like this, where you're in full sun, there's nothing you can do about it. The full sun looks terrible. So even when you add strobe, it's not great. So what we've done here is we have a Lastolite translucent frame on the left. You can see the shadow of it on the ground there. And what that's doing is that's blocking the full sun. So it feels like they're in shade, similar to the woman in Oregon. I'm adding this strobe on the front to give it some direction and make the light a little bit more flattering. So it feels like there's direction. It's still full sun. And you can see on the final, we actually cropped right at the edge of the shadow. So it didn't feel so obvious um, on the ground there. But you get to control the light while still being in full sun. Obviously for something like this to really do that with a frame or something like that, you need another person to block the light. Uh, but maybe you can get that person. Similar thing here. There are situations like this where the assistant that was helping me is in the frame. There's nothing I can do about it because that's where it needs to be. The client needed him on the left. We needed that empty space on the right. The frame is not 90 feet high. It has to be quite close to block it. So what we did, same thing, light on the right, blocking the sun on the left or from the right as well. But with the camera locked down, I was able to do a second frame that we didn't light with nothing that I was able to use to just composite in so that you couldn't tell. Uh, somebody's asking, why isn't she masked? Because that picture was from before uh, this time. She's not masked because that picture is old. Not all of these are from uh, the last few months. Many of them aren't because there's only so many pictures I've done over the last few months. Um, but that is why. If you're on my set, if you're around me, anywhere near me on a set of mine, the only person who isn't wearing a mask is the person being photographed. And then they should be putting on the mask when they're not being photographed. I'll also mention, I'm a big proponent that you shouldn't be touching your subjects, at least I shouldn't. Uh, so if you need to adjust something on a subject, in normal times, I'll tell them what I need to do. If there's a stylist or somebody, they can handle it. But you know, if I feel like that zipper needs to be higher or lower on this jacket, I will say to him, uh, can you bring the zipper up or down? I'm not going to do it. The, the only exception is if the subject says, can you just do it? Then I might, depending on the situation. That's under normal circumstances. Now, even more, we shouldn't be touching our subjects. We've, we should be maintaining that distance. We need to figure out a way to communicate. So sometimes you'll mirror, uh, sometimes you'll just use your hands, go you know, left, right, trying to adjust. Uh, Miguel Kila is another Sony artisan, likes to tell people, imagine that their face is a basketball in his hand and he'll move his hand around. Anything that you can do to communicate what you need while still maintaining that distance. Again, I don't think it can be emphasized enough, even under normal circumstances, we really shouldn't be touching our models. Even when people say it's fine, people say that and they don't necessarily mean it. But now, especially. Uh, this is the mayor of New Haven, Connecticut. This also was from before the COVID times. So it's a Bowen's battery powered 500 watt strobe with a last delight uh, softbox. This is obviously a different angle. And then of course, there's constant lights. So constant lights are great if you're going to shoot video. They're great for a lot of things. They are limited outside. If you're in full sun, you need so much constant source light to actually be able to do anything with the sun 
that it's prohibitive. I mean, there's a reason you'll see if you're walking around town and you see a movie set and they've got those enormous lights, it's because you need a huge amount of power and generators. However, if you're in the shade like this is, even with that dappled sun, you can use a constant source light. So this is a light and motion CLX8, which is an 8,000 lumen uh, LED light with a little, little tiny octobank on there. This was also at Condo. So again, before, uh, before COVID. And it just helps clean it up a little. When you're in deep shade, things can feel a little mushy, a little murky, and sometimes the color can get weird. Adding a little bit of light can help with that. It can just help brighten it up and even it out a little. And then we have speed lights. So speed lights, you know, on camera flash type lights. I use the Sony speed lights, the HVL F60 RM and the HVL F60, or I'm sorry, F45 RM, as well as the Sony transmitter, which is like the FAWRC1 or something like that. I, I honestly don't know why um, things are numbered and named the way they are. So for this photo, it's, you can see a speed light on the back with a little uh, easy box speed light too. Speed light on the front that's super clamped to the wall. And it adds this little bit of pop. This is downtown, uh, just off Houston. I can't speak for other cities. Every city is different, but in New York City, you need a permit if you wanna put a light on the ground. So I will sometimes put lights not on the ground. Is it strictly speaking following the rules? I don't know. I'm gonna argue that it is, but if a police officer comes up and tells you you have to move your light, you should probably move your light, unless you have a permit. So this is the Williamsburg Bridge, the lights mounted to the uh, railing there. One of the reasons that, especially in a crowded place that they want you to have a permit is safety. There's a lot of people coming and going. And so if somebody trips over your light, that's a bad thing. Whether or not you hate that person, maybe you want somebody to trip over your light, which hopefully you don't, but you're still potentially financially liable. There's still the fact that we should all be reasonable, good people and good members of society. So this is a way to use lights that really minimizes the impact on other people. Again, with speed lights, uh, this is three of them. You can see one on the right, one on the left, and there's one down that fire escape uh, behind her. You can see this is, you know, obviously available light. You can see how much daylight there is. And then when you see the final exposure, it adds a lot of drama and a lot of control. So even with a speed light, you can do a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you want to take pictures. Everything's good. You've got somebody to photograph, or maybe you want to do self-portraits. What do you do? It's a tricky world. You can't get around that much. Maybe you don't want to walk around for hours uh, in these COVID times. How are you going to find a location? So for some of you, what I'm about to say is going to sound super obvious although I'm sure some of what I've said has sounded super obvious to everybody because we all know some things and don't know some things. We're all learning and we all still know a bunch. I don't think I've ever been to a talk where there wasn't something that I'm like, oh, really? I know this. But then there's also something that I'm like, oh, that's cool. So Google Maps, we all know Google Maps and Street View. So if you look at a map of somewhere like New York City, Anywhere that is blue means that there's street view. So that means you can click there and see what it looks like whenever Google's car with the camera went down that street. So it may not look exactly like that. Maybe there's scaffolding up there now that there wasn't then, or maybe there was scaffolding and that's down, but it gives you a sense of it. So 
if you're like, I want to photograph in Manhattan, I'm not sure where, you can basically walk down the street via Google Street View and see what the street looks like and find the angles you want to see. So this is in Dumbo on Washington Street, the photograph of the Manhattan Bridge that everybody in the world photographs. I think we've all seen a million of those pictures. We've probably also done those pictures. I certainly have. Just because it's been done a million times doesn't mean you shouldn't take that picture if you want to. So maybe you'll bring something new to it, or maybe it's just cool because it's your picture. But this gives you a sense of where it is. You can figure out where it is. You can figure out uh, the angle, and it can help you decide when and where to go and what time to be there. And it's really, really easy, especially now where I at least in minimizing my time doing things that I don't need to be doing. And then of course you can look at things like Instagram and Flickr. Uh, Flickr in particular, if you put in Times Square, it will show you a bajillion pictures of Times Square and that can help give you a sense of what a place looks like. Something like Times Square is gonna have thousands and thousands of pictures, apparently 93,098 when I did this screenshot. Uh, whereas, you know, the corner by your apartment is going to have less probably. So it may not be as useful, but it's a good place to also take a look at. And then again, in New York City, and I can't speak to other places, if you're unsure where you can photograph, if it is, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so bear that in mind. Uh, if it is New York City property and it is outside, you can probably photograph there if you're using a handheld camera or a tripod and everything is handheld. You can't put things on the ground and you can't stop people from using wherever you are. You can't, it, so it says not asserting exclusive use of city property. So you can't tell people they can't walk in front of your camera but you can photograph almost anywhere if it's public property. You can put a tripod in the middle of the Times Square if you want. If somebody decides that you're impeding foot traffic or a danger, you may have to move, but in general, you're fine. This has been this way for a few years. Before that, it was a little squishy, it wasn't clear. So sometimes you'd have people say you can't photograph, sometimes people would say you can, uh, but at the time it was easier to get a permit. You can also get a permit, which is a $300 fee and will allow you to do things like put uh, tripods in, or no, you can do a tripod, but put light stands on the ground. Uh, if you need parking, if you need all sorts of stuff, then you do need a permit. Um, $300, the New York City website, Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment has all the details. There are different rules, again, for every, uh, every city, every place. I have found in general, if you are doing non-commercial photography, you probably don't need a permit, meaning that nobody is being paid to do that photo. You probably don't need a permit, except that often the person who's coming up to you asking if you need a permit doesn't understand the distinction. And if you're using a light or a tripod or a camera with a big lens, they feel like you're a professional photographer and you need a permit even if you don't. And that can be a challenging situation to get into and you can't always win. I will say sometimes though, if you're just nice about it, they'll let you. I was using a light in, out in LA once and I was in this park and I knew I, I wasn't doing a commercial photo shoot. I was just shooting to shoot but I knew that someone would think I was doing a commercial shoot and somebody came and told me I had to move. <clears throat> so I explained what we were doing and was really polite. And he said, well, this is county property, but if you move over there about 50 feet, that's state property and that's not my department. So we did that. And we only learned that because we were nice to the guy and polite. Um, all right. Are there any questions that have come up or does anybody have any questions? that we haven't answered. Uh, if you have them, I'm happy to answer. If you don't, well, then I can't answer them. And again, I will say everybody should go check out uh, 
condo everywhere. If you want to hear me talk to other people that shoot Sony cameras, you should check out the Sony Alpha Photographers podcast. All right. Thanks, everybody.